here after last week. Um, it's a thrill, actually, and an honor to, to be back here together in community and sharing stories and seeing what we can do to move forward um, after we hear these. We're going to do some quick little introductions of who we are, why we're here. Quick show of hands. Who was here last week? Great. Great. Love it that you returned. That's a good sign. Um, all right. I'm Elka Hoffman, as Kate said. Um, I am a German Filipino immigrant to the United States. Um, coming to this work from originally from the lens of like environmental stewardship and creation care. And as Latham and I worked on a project together at our former place of employment, really realized um, something that was missing in the creation care and the environmental stewardship work that I was doing. And that is the reconnection to interdependence with the land and with each other and what that means for healing um, for all beings. And so that's why I entered into this work and it has grown from there. Hi, um, my name is Lathrum. I grew up in Franklin, Tennessee, uh, about 20 minutes south. I've been back in Nashville for the last three years. Um, I come from ancestors who settled in the U.S. in the late 1700s and were colonizers and enslavers on Muscogee lands in Alabama and um, lands where we're standing right here today. Um, and come to this work with the hope and desire of healing and justice and looking back so that we can move forward together. Good evening. My name is Albert Pender, and I'm a Cherokee, and um, this is all Cherokee land. In fact, all of Nashville is, sits on Cherokee land, and the land of the Cherokee Nation extends all the way into West Tennessee to the Tennessee River, and beyond that was always considered the land of the Chickasaw Nation. I am uh, an attorney, although retired, uh, in active retirement, and I am a um, journalist and um, a historian. And again, I'm glad to see that we have a really a goodly number of people here this evening. And for this particular uh, meeting, I decided that um, since we were going to talk about action and getting people involved, I decided to uh, wear my marching pants. <laughs> I decided since I'm going to talk about action, I better look like I'm ready for some action. <laughs> and uh, since I've been in Nashville, I've been involved in a number of um, uh, demonstrations and protests, demonstrations to preserve ancient Native American sites and burial sites, demonstrations against the Hermitage, which is the home of the very infamous Andrew Jackson. And um, in a better world, we wouldn't have a Hermitage. We would have uh, a monument to the tens of thousands of indigenous peoples whose deaths are responsible for the actions of Andrew Jackson. But uh, without going any further, I'm uh, again glad to be with you here this, after, uh, this uh, evening. And uh, we're going to play it by ear in terms of um, throwing out suggestions and seeking suggestions for things for people to do and things that you would like to do to help further this movement along. Okay, quick business um, before we ground and center ourselves in tonight's um, time of sharing. There is a clipboard going around. Please make sure that everyone um, signs up on that clipboard. We have a resource kit as a follow-up for our times together last week and this week. We want to make sure everyone gets that. We don't want people floating out there without this um, because there's a lot of things that are coming bubbling up and uh, 
we want to stay accountable to that and make sure that we don't just leave people out there on their own. Um, so please do sign that clipboard and uh, we'll make sure to follow up with you all at the end of the session. Um, and then we will have some time for discourse um, format to be determined. Um, so in this first little bit, we've got about 20 minutes where we're going to be sharing. Um, we'll share first and then we'll, we'll start opening it up so that we all can share in the story creations together, okay? All right. A little bit of grounding um, for tonight. Um, I want to invite you all to get into place. If you would, just go ahead and put your feet solidly on the ground. Um, like I said last week, we normally would like to do this outside. Um, I'm not going to throw soil all over here, but let's just pretend like we're grounding um, with the land and have our feet solid. And then I invite you to um, close your eyes as I share this remembrance. Um, and reflection with, with this group. Let us first remember the trees. If you can imagine a thousand years ago to when this area at the bottom of the hill and all that our eyes could see was covered in a vast forest of maple, oak, chestnut, and hickory. A squirrel could travel for miles without touching the ground. Let us remember the indigenous people who lived here from time immemorial, who hunted the buffalo, elk, and deer that once roamed here. The Mississippian Indian culture who created vast networks of agricultural communities in large cities, who raised the three sisters of corn, beans, and squash, and who built large ceremonial mounds through Tennessee and the Southeast. Let us remember the Cherokee, the Shawnee, the Uchi, the Creek, Choctaw, the Chickasaw, who thrived here for hundreds of years, at times once where you could, walk, you could not walk anywhere where native feet had not touched the land before European settlers arrived in the area in the 1700s. The peoples who were forcibly removed by Andrew Jackson in his Indian Removal Act of 1830 and were marched on the Trail of Tears over a bridge across the Cumberland River where downtown Nashville now stands, off this, th off this land that they had lived on for 14,000 years to unfamiliar and unwelcoming territory. By the 1850s, 20% of Tennessee residents were black and living in slavery, the same time the Belmont Mansion build was completed by mostly enslaved folks. 270 enslaved people lived and worked on this land under the enslavement of Isaac Franklin, the largest slave trader in the US, and then taken and then with the Ackland family as inherited property. Let us remember the names of those we know, Betsy and her children, Alexander, Ivy, James, Joseph, Amanda and Harriet, the Baker and Snowden families, Brutus and Fanny, William Ackland, who was given to Adelaisha, sorry, I'm working on that, Adelaisha Ackland by her father in 1839 and those others named and unnamed at Freedom Plaza on the Belmont University campus. Let us remember the changing of this landscape as the land once again becomes parceled off with the Pilkertons of Pilkerton Railroad Company acquiring the land BUMC sits on from the Ackland estate sale. We know the land exchange hands again going to C.C. and Edna Halbrook and Leela and Leela B. Annette, who in 1972 sold this parcel of land to Belmont United Methodist Church, building on top of the footprints and artifacts of those who tended the land before. Let us remember and not forget, and let us move forward in this remembering, giving thanks to those who came before and who are still here, and embracing the stewardship of these stories that this soil holds that is now our privilege to uphold and share as agents of healing and repair. Thank you. Albert, if you would begin us off with our action with your marching pants. <laughs> well, I have reflected since um, last week's meeting, and um, we are trying to build a movement. Well, not trying to build a movement. A movement already exists in Nashville. A movement for 
the betterment of all Nashvilleans. And we're trying to strengthen a movement, as it were. And a lot of uh, the actions that myself and people in the American uh, Indian Coalition, that which name has changed to the Indigenous Peoples Coalition, and I'll tell you why. Um, I was at a meeting which I was invited to uh, in the Louisville, Kentucky a few months ago, and there was a young Native American activist from the Navajo Nation there, and she spoke about how that the term American Indian didn't really seem to fit because we are indigenous nations and not exactly American Indians. And so we changed the name of our organization from the American Indian Coalition to the Indigenous Peoples Coalition because we, and that means myself and other natives, have come to the feeling that indigenous better expre expresses who we are because we have existed for thousands upon thousands of years before the formation of the nation now called the United States. And something else I found very interesting, uh, geological fact, that all of you are familiar with the Great Smoky Mountains. Well, the Smoky Mountains at one time were higher than the Rocky Mountains, but the Smokies are so old that through the process of erosion, they are now much smaller. And according to geological estimates, the Smokies erode at the rate of two inches every 1,000 years. And what struck me about this was the fact that, okay, Native peoples, indigenous peoples, we've been fighting these battles for 500 years since since Columbus landed, and ever since that time, the Smokies have eroded one inch. You know, and I, <laughs> and that to me was a very significant fact, because 500 years can seem like a long time, but to the Smokies, it's just an inch. <laughs> They're just an inch shorter. But getting to, uh, types of activities and things that people can engage in. One of the um, big activities right now is the fact that all of you are gathered here to listen to the presentations that we have to give. And one way of getting people in action or getting people started doing things is by telling people things that they didn't know or things that they should know, the imparting of knowledge. And so, as I said, I've engaged in a lot of uh, demonstrations and protests, and, and there's a lot of things that you here can do in terms of um, impacting the, on the city of Nashville, contact with council people, um, phone trees, and there's also a volunteer list, as I understand, that's being circulated for people who want to continue involvement and the like. And there's so many things and issues that need to be dealt with. One of them is the um, proposed East Bank development. Excuse me. Another one is the Titan Stadium. And from the research that I've done, in the past few months or a couple of years, it appears that the East Bank and the Titan Stadium are incomparably, or shall we say, um, very much tied together. The mayor, Mayor Cooper, wants to develop what he calls a great new neighborhood on the East Bank. But for indigenous people, we have to look at all the great things and great antiquities that exist on the East Bank, including 
an ancient city that covers all of the uh, East Bank and all of downtown Nashville, and we need to slow down this development so that proper attention and proper reverence can be given to the untold and countless generations of Native American people, indigenous people, pardon me, indigenous, instead of saying Native American, indigenous people who lived here before us. And looking at how the uh, Titan statement is, Stadium is tied into that, I received uh, early today um, a document which I have had a chance to peruse and I need to read again called Reject the Proposed Stadium Deal. And it's by Bob Mendez, <coughs> who is a council person at large and who is the chairperson of the East Bank um, Committee to determine the pros and cons of putting together a Titan Stadium. His conclusion is, uh, or rather a new Titan Stadium, his conclusion is, is that there should be no new Titan Stadium and that there are better alternatives because what he's saying is, is that the cost of a new Titan Stadium will be borne on the backs of Nashville taxpayers. And uh, this means that we would be paying for a new Titan Stadium. Now, I don't know how many of you are avid football fans, and uh, myself, I'm not. And that isn't casting any aspersions on those of you who are. My favorite sport is watching Cherokee stickball, Anija, and <laughs> which I do every year at the Eastern Cherokee Reservation at the Cherokee Indian Fair. And for <clears throat> Cherokee stickball, I'm extremely excited and enthused. Not so for American football. Again, that's to cast no aspersions on American football. Those of you who are, that's fine. But I'll stick with Cherokee stickball. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I want to uh, speak about uh, Vanderbilt and uh, briefly and land acknowledgments and to this day the Chancellor of Vanderbilt is in adamant opposition to adopting a land acknowledgment recognizing whose land Vanderbilt sits on, the native peoples whose land Vanderbilt sits on. The uh, Chancellor's name is Diermeyer. He's from Germany, born and raised in Berlin. And he's playing the role of uh, consistently being an invader. He's refusing to even acknowledge that native people exist. He's in favor of the erasure of native history in Nashville by refusing to acknowledge a land acknowledgement. <coughs> and this is making national news because recently, just no more than a week ago, it was reported in USA Today the fact of Chancellor Diermeyer refusing to recognize a land acknowledgement. And uh, I think as far as I'm concerned, Chancellor Diermeyer might be the Chancellor of Vanderbilt, but I think he needs to go home. <laughs> <laughs> He needs to go home. <laughs> he needs to go back to Berlin, and I'll sure help him pack. <laughs> but um, as I said here, we're trying to develop a movement, and we're trying to uh, not tell people what to do, but to make suggestions and to elicit suggestions from you as to what you think you could do to help make this move, take this movement along and to stop uh, subsidies to uh, corporations that are <coughs> uh, working not for the betterment of Nashville, but just to make that almighty American dollar. And so I'm going to end what I'm saying right now and um, turn it back over to, uh, yeah, oh. Back to Elkie or? Uh, <laughs> um, 
post-its and pens for those of you that were not here. This was part of my housekeeping that I was supposed to do earlier. Um, it's for you to take notes um, for reflections. Um, but also I wanna give a prom prompting questions um, for our time together right now and for you to reflect on what you're hearing and then maybe even post, um, post some of that there. So the first question I'd like for you all to consider as you're hearing Albert and Latham and I speak tonight, um, how can I as an individual engage in this healing work? And then collectively, if you all are part of Belmont UMC, how can we as a church work towards healing and repair? So hold on to those things as you're hearing us talk tonight and reflect on that on your post-its. Um, thank you, Albert, for all of your wisdom and experience and knowledge that you have to share. Um, we are lucky to be in this room with him tonight. Um, I'm going to build on that. Um, and, yeah, maybe first do a little bit of framing. Um, if we're people committed to collective healing, then this is part of our repair that needs attention. Um, thank you for returning for those that did return. I think that that is a choice that we make as people to continue to return to this work. Um, and this work is lifelong. So you choose to return to it over and over and over again. So thank you for coming back today if you were with us last week. Um, I think that something else to, to say is our different ancestral identities require different actions of us. So my ancestral identity, who I am, my class experience might require something totally different than my friend Elka or my friend Mr. Bender. Um, but we are moving towards the same goal and the same vision. Um, but those, our identities inform our action and inform our responsibilities to action. Um, and we, we were really excited about this part too. We were really excited about talking about action. Um, truth telling is a huge piece of this. Um, imparting this knowledge is a huge piece of this, but you tell the truth so that you can inform your action. If you just tell the truth and we sit in that truth and nothing changes, what are we doing? Um, so we tell the truth to inform our actions. Um, and then I, I wanted to talk a little bit about emotions and like how these feelings show up in our bodies before I talk about um, some of my actions. And um, in my own experience, my desire to move towards repair through these actions or through reparations or through land back um, with the consideration of my own class experience in ancestral harm it's not from a place of guilt or shame. Those are feelings that I have felt at different times and still do. Um, but my commitment to that is a recognition of, of harm and a commitment to justice. Um, and I think that we need to hold on to those things too. That this telling the truth demands justice. And that is enough. That's enough reason to act and build a different world. Um, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the legacy of enslavement um, as it is still experienced in the world today, how it still shows up in the world today, and um, a commitment to repair through that, um, through talking about reparations. Um, so reparations is a word that a lot of people have um, a historical or a political understanding of. Um, you might have felt something in your body when I said that word just now. Maybe not. Um, but I think that there's an aversion to that word that we need to be curious about. Um, I was talking about reparations with a friend. Um, I was fundraising for a campaign. And I asked them if what that word meant to them. And they didn't have a political understanding of it or a historical understanding of it. And their answer to me was, does it mean to repair something? And I said, yes, that's exactly what it means. So um, I would encourage you to hold on to that. When you hear that word, reparations, that is the root of it, is to repair harm that is from the past, a commitment to a different future that is based on a past harm. Um, and you can share that. Even if that's your action today, go into the world and share that that is the root of reparations. 
Um, but by definitions, reparations are the act or process of making amends for a wrong, a process of repairing, healing, and restoring a people injured because of their group identity and in violation of their fundamental human rights by governments, corporations, institutions, and families. It requires truth and a commitment to non-repeat. It requires truth and an action to act. Um, Albert was just talking about land acknowledgments. Um, that is truth, and then um, it also requires action. So there is a difference between telling the truth and then telling the truth that is, is moving us towards acting, whether that is paying a land tax or giving land back or paying monetary reparations. Um, yeah, so why reparations? Um, the legacy of slave enslavement has never been addressed. Um, the Reconstruction failed, a reign of terror followed, we live in the system of mass incarceration, and the most extreme racial wealth gap that exists right now. Um, all of this can be tied back to land, which we will continue to talk about. In 1865, formerly enslaved peoples were promised 40 acres and a mule, which is something that we probably know. But that was overturned when Lincoln was assassinated and it was never executed. Sometimes I wonder what the world would look like if that had been fulfilled. What would it look like in our racial, in our wealth, our, the wealth dynamic of our country if people were given land, if people were never pushed off of their land? What would the wealth dynamic look like? Um, but land is the basis of wealth, and it has, it has been built, our wealth has been built on the basis of land. So then we think about home ownership, which is another means of owning land. In Nashville, 68% of white residents own their home, compared to 34% of African Americans. This ranks Nashville as the 24th largest gap in the U.S. among the 50 largest metro areas. This is due to a history of redlining. Can you raise your hand for me if you know that word? Okay, cool, most, most people. Um, this is due, due to years of redlining. Um, redlining is when lenders refuse to lend money to hazardous areas um, that were intentionally redlined by the bank um, to not invest in. And um, historically, these were always um, black neighborhoods, historically black neighborhoods. Um, one of these in Nashville includes our neighbors of Edge Hill, which are, which are a block and a, a mile and a half away, a five minute drive, a 25 minute walk. Um, today, we see the inverse effect, where developers are coming in to the once called hazardous areas with l when they had historically low, low investment and begging the neighbors that do own these homes to sell at a low price just so they can be flipped for extremes. Some of my friends that are elders in North Nashville, they get knocks on their door every single day. They have a, f a phone call, like their, um, their phones are blocked because 90% of the phone calls they receive are from developers trying to buy their home. So imagine if that was you, if you were sitting in your home and over and over, you were just receiving calls of people to buy this home that you've lived in for 63 years. So that's happened in Edge Hill. That's happened all over town, which we know. But it's the inverse, re re it's the inverse effect, or we, yeah, the inverse effect of redlining, where you are having developers come into these neighborhoods that have been historically marked as hazardous, but the same people are still the ones benefiting. So you still have the developers benefiting while the folks that are, have lived in that neighborhood are not receiving those benefits. For me, this begs the question, when is enough enough? Will we always just be accumulating more and more and more? And how, when will we stop? Um, the, yeah, so white Americans hold 84% of the total US wealth but make up only 60% of the population while black Americans hold 4% of the wealth and make up 13% of the population. Put another way, the wealth of the richest 400 Americans is approximately equal to that of 43 million black Americans. So when we consider the facts, the racial wealth gap is a, an astronomical way to understand that the legacy of enslavement is continuing today. And part of this goes back to the 
um, the lack of, of building, being able to build wealth from the beginning because there is no basis of being able to sit on land. Mind, mind you, land that was stolen too. Um, on the way over here, we were talking about actions and we were talking about how these two things sit in conversation with each other. Albert's efforts of indigenous activism are, can be complementary to the efforts of black liberation and reparation. Those two things do not have to be in competition or in conflict. So hear that today too, that those complement one another. Um, okay, one more minute, two more minutes. Okay. Um, so how do we do this? How do, how do we do reparations? Um, I think that it's a practice that we have to figure out together. Um, HR 40 is a, has been stalled in Congress for the last um, over 30 years, but it would be a bill to study reparations. Other nations have done this, South Africa, Canada with the First Nations people. We have examples of this, um, but it cannot make it through. Um, we also don't have to wait for the federal government to study or practice reparations. We have local and personal, for in some circumstances, levels of responsibility. Consider where does the church already have relationships that might require reparations? Are you attached to an institution that was built on the labor of enslaved peoples? Are you attached to a hospital that has caused harm through studies that has affected people's bodies? All of these are avenues for reparations. There are people all across the nation that are studying and practicing this work. In Evanston, Illinois, they have pledged $10 million in the form of reparations to individuals for house payments and mortgages and car payments. There is a campaign in Vermont called Every Town where they're demanding for every um, city to provide land to um, indigenous and um, black community members. There is an organization called the Black Land and Liberation Initiative where they are calling for reparations now and they are distributing that to uh, Afro-Indigenous black land stewards across the nation. Um, even in Mobile, Alabama, where some of my family is from, they are working on a reparations campaign for descendants of Clotilda, which was the last transatlantic slave trip ship to come into the US. So I'm saying this to say that I think that so often we think about how are we gonna do this? How can we do this? There are pathways, there are avenues, there are examples. Um, and to the, the root of this is to repair. Thanks, Lather. I want to be very mindful of our time together and the fact that this isn't just about us sitting up here. And I know that you all have stories to share as well. And we want to be in conversation with everyone in this room. So I'm just going to take two minutes to share just very quickly on something that I feel is worth noting. And that is the tie between what we've heard Albert and Latham talk about, and that's land. Um, I want us to kind of think about how have we moved away from being interdependent with the land? How have we gotten here to where land is a tool to oppress and has become abused and thought of as something to be owned, where we have imaginary lines drawn through it, like the redlining, um, as, a, as a way to segregate as a way to cause harm to other individuals, we're supposed to be in interdependence with the land. Um, the land's not supposed to be hurting us, and we're not supposed to be hurting the land. So what do we do with that, with what we're hearing? And part of that is through this repair, this reparations and this healing work that we're talking about. Um, I want us to consider land back and what that means. Um, there are land back movements that have been happening for a long time. We're hearing a lot about it right now, but for hundreds of years, actually, land back has been practiced. And what we're seeing right now is a, a real recognition of why this is important um, to get land back into the original hands and to the original stewards of the lands, and that is to the indigenous people, or into the, land, into the hands of folks that were forcibly removed off the land, like the Bruce family out in California, who just very recently was a black family that uh, were pushed off the land by the KKK out in, in the 1910s out in uh, Manhattan Beach. And they just very recently, over the last couple of years, won the land back. 
um, through a movement and through organizing a group like us getting together and saying that's not okay and moving forward to get the land back. Um, we see land out in Oakland, California that has been returned uh, to the Ohlone tribe. We're seeing stuff even here in Tennessee. Um, the Eastern Cherokee Band has uh, received, Albert, how many acres? A hundred and how many acres in East Tennessee with the Eastern Cherokee? No, there's two different tribes. Okay. Several hundred acres each. Yeah. Yeah, so it's happening here in Tennessee too. Um, but I want us to be aware that these move, movements are happening and we are seeing this as being called as important. Um, we're not extracting and we are working towards repair. There's other ways of repairing land as well, but I think that I want us to talk about that and I don't want to be the one sharing that with all of us. Um, are you all okay if we stay together as a group? Okay. All right, then I am going to open it up for anyone in this room that would like to share how they are involved in some actions, maybe around what we've been talking about, um, ways that we all could get involved, ways that you all could add to the stories that we've been sharing. Is there anyone here that would like to share something that they've been working on or questions? We're recording this, by the way, everyone, so the mic is gonna go around so other folks can hear. Are you <laughs> both if you want, but this doesn't this doesn't amplify. We're not live streaming this, but we're recording it for those after this who would like to watch. So if you could just keep that. Um, my question is pretty general. I am not involved in a community doing this kind of work. I live in Los Angeles, but I would like to be, mm -hmm. and I appreciate the work of this community, and I'm sure the greater community that hiding behind these walls and all over the country. But I'm curious if there are more immediate suggestions for practical actions or groups I can join, because I don't know what my first steps would be or even should be. Sure, and are you asking about out in California specifically? Yeah, but here while I'm here too, yeah. really, really all around. Okay, absolutely. So I'm gonna start here because I, I have a feeling that that will answer some other people's questions yeah. and then I can maybe tag on to some stuff that's going on in California. You wanna start, you want me to start? No, I can start. Okay. Um, how long are you here? <laughs> I am here for two weeks. Two weeks? Yeah. Okay. It's not technically two weeks. Yeah. Um, well, maybe Albert and I can talk a little bit more about the East Bank um, efforts that are happening. Um, so in two weekends on the 25th, there is a, a community event. It's called Reimagine East Bank. Um, we can share that. We'll make sure that everyone gets it. There's also, out, when on your way out, there's a flyer that has a QR code that you can scan, and it'll take you to the um, event sign up. Um, that is going to be a space to learn more about some of the folks that are working on East Bank efforts. Um, and we're talking about eventually um, maybe having a tour of the East Bank land, doing an all, uh, telling the true history of what has happened there. Even if, there, even if a Titan Stadium gets built, even if East Bank gets developed, this is a, a constant negotiation. Maybe this is a window to demand something very, you know, exciting from the city of Nashville. Um, so I say that to say, don't be discouraged by the fact that the Titans and Oracle have a lot of money. Um, it's still a part of the fight. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're going to figure out how to have a table there. We are. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, so definitely put that on your radar on the 25th. Yeah, and we have a flyer for that. Um, 
when we send out our resource kit, there will also be a lot of more things just to put on your radar that can be shared. Um, whether that is like imparting knowledge, like Albert was saying, like the fact that even if you're walking down the street, just sharing with the person you're walking with, hey, do you know what happened on this land? Do you know who this land belongs to? There's so much power in understanding where you're situated to help you, to help inform these histories that are often forgotten. Um, LA? Sure. Yeah, so as I mentioned, there's the movement that happened with Bruce's Beach and Manhattan Beach, which is not too far up the road from me, right? Yeah, and um, there's actually a couple of organizations that w got involved and actually were formed because of that movement. Um, specifically, I'd like to highlight the Where Is My Land group. Um, that is the one that is still very much active in getting reparations uh, specifically around land back to the black community that have been forced off the land. And that's going on throughout the entire United States, but they are based in LA. Um, and we actually had a meeting with them and um, I can definitely recommend the work that they're doing. There's definitely a place to get involved with. Um, up the way from you, up in Oakland, there's the Sogaritier, have it, am I saying that right? I'm butchering names tonight. Um, but the land trust up there that's very active in working on returning land to indigenous uh, peoples and tribes and nations um, all along the West Coast, but mostly focused up in the northern part of California. And um, then Berkeley is actually very much involved in work with reparations and land back. So there's several groups um, that are programs that have spun off of things that are happening within Berkeley. And if you sign that sheet, I will email them very, so you'll get all those links, okay? Um, beyond our kit. Um, Roland, is that right? Was that your name? Yes. I did not butcher your name. I'd like to tell you, can, can you hear this? I'd like, to, I'd like to tell you about the Tennessee ancient sites. And its mission is to protect the ancient sites of the original people. I can never remember that word, Albert. So I always say the original people. And so, um, it's to dedicated to listen to the American Indians and also the archaeologists and try to med mediate between the two and protect these ancient sites. Right now, we are actually maintaining five different ceremonial and, uh, mounds around Tennessee. And in the next couple months, there'll be an opportunity right up the road here at West Haven, over outside of Franklin, and there's a big mound there, and we'll be going there, and we'll be clearing brush, and there's a nice sign there now indicating the history there. And so we're working on that all the time, and I would really love it if anybody wants to connect with me. We'll put it in this uh, packet that you're coming out with, and uh, it would be great. I will go out there. I'll be wearing my Levi's too, Albert. Yeah, Albert, do you want to answer yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of literature in terms of um, we're determining that. One book that was published, oh, several, yeah, maybe a couple of decades ago, is called Tennessee's uh, Ancient in in Indian, Tennessee's Indian Peoples by Ronald Satz, S-A-T-Z. And then a very recent publication detailing the vastness of the ancient Native American city that Nashville, downtown Nashville sits on top of is a book entitled Mastodons to Mississippians. And it's by um, Aaron Dieterwolf with the Department of Archaeology. And uh, although he's an archaeologist, he's a good guy. <laughs> I'm in uh, regular contact with him, and he's been, uh, we have gotten along famously. But he, in his book, 
states about how vast the population of ancient Nashville was, upwards of 400,000. And uh, there are a lot of other um, publications that um, I am privy to that I can um, inform you about. But, there is, but I would recommend uh, those two books, and in particular the latest one, Mastodons, the Mississippians, by Aaron Dieterwolf. Mm -hmm. There's also um, a website called Native Land that we'll share, and you can type in your zip code, and it will show you all of the overlapping areas of the um, indigenous peoples that are in that space. And um, I've been trying to include it in my like travel practices, like whichever I land I'm visiting, that's something that I learn um, and continue to be a visitor to the lands that I go to. Yeah, you can profile all all over the U.S. Yeah, dot native. I I'll show you. But you can find it easily. Just real quick to tag on to that, um, if you're looking for land records and that, we also have links in the resource kit. Like some of the stuff that I quoted w in the remembrance that we opened up in, um, like who owned the land, how the land was transferred from person to person, a lot of that um, we pulled up through specific sites that we can, that you as personal historians can go and look up too. So if you're wanting to do that for even the, the land that your house sits on, you're, you're Mm-hmm, yep. Oh, sorry. Um, here and then over here, okay. Uh, yeah, so I have a question about um, each of y'all's perspectives on what this looks like. Uh, and I know the work is never really finished, but what, what an ideal scenario would look like uh, for each of you, in maybe just in one area, just in Nashville mm -hmm. or just in Tennessee. But I'm curious as to, uh, you know, it, when when can you reach that seventh day, right? Like when can you rest, um, and, and what would that look like? <laughs> Albert. Well, interesting. You should put it. When uh, would I reach that seventh day? I don't think I'll ever reach it. <laughs> uh, I would like to reach it, but um, I've been fighting these battles for oh some decades now in uh, all over the country from uh, East Coast to West Coast to places in between. I've been an attorney for tribes in different parts of the Western United States. And I guess that in order to, um, well, I mean, dreaming my dream would be that the land back movement is not asking that any non-native vacate their land or business. But I will say this, there are large and huge tracts of unoccupied land all over this country that belong to different tribes, different nations. And when I talk about land acknowledgments, one of the most important things to be mindful of in any land acknowledgement is that we as indigenous people don't refer to, say, Nashville as was the land of the Cherokee, as was the land of the Creek, as was the land of the Choctaw. We refer to it as still is Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek land, Shawnee land, this is still our land that you're sitting on. And I think that a lot of attention should be given to returning these large unoccupied tracts of land to native people. Because I can drive in any direction in the state of Tennessee and I'll look on either side of the road and they're just large acres of unoccupied land that should be returned to native people. And I would say that this is the first part of dreaming my dream. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I would add on to that dream is that we know what enough is and feels like, and we share the surplus, and we don't live in a world where we are constantly accumulating more and more and more. Um, yeah. And that land, land is part of that sharing. Um, there's no reason to hold on to what you don't need when it could be shared and it could help us move towards something different. Yeah, and I think my answer is very similar. Um, I'm not sure that we'll fully get there um, come my seventh day, but it looks like that we've moved away from extraction and have gotten back to interdependence, extraction from the land, extraction from each other, um, in a way where we recognize that we don't have to live in a scarcity mindset and our systems don't perpetuate that. And we can live in a understanding that abundance does exist and that, that abundance is a connection to that interdependence with land, with each other. Um, we've got a question right here. Um, here first, right? Yep. Um, when, when I was in school, we went on a field trip to see Indian Mounds, I think out in Montgomery Bell State Park. But we were not shown or told about anything indigenous within like Davidson County. We went to Fort Nashboro. Um, are there particular sites in Davidson County that are of, of, of particular significance or even sacredness that are unrecognized or underrecognized? Yes. I would say that uh, originally Davidson County had about 80 uh, different mounds in it, and uh, a lot of them were uh, destroyed and used for landfill over the um, uh, uh, past century or so. But um, there are a lot of mounds that are still, and uh, this is not just within Davidson County, but within the state of Tennessee that are unknown to the general public. And in fact, Tennessee is considered the most archeologically rich state in the entire Southeast. There are upwards of still 15,000 mounds that uh, some of which are known, many of which are unknown. And uh, within uh, Davidson County, most of the mounds have been destroyed. And I would say in terms of a sacred site, and this is including uh, the destruction of a mound, but I would say a sacred site is the um, existed at the, where the Sound Stadium, baseball stadium, is now. That was where, in 2014, first knowledge of the vast ancient Native American city was found when they were constructing, had begun construction of the uh, Sound Stadium. And a lot of the places within Davidson County say on the East Bank. There are mounds on the East Bank. Uh, the Top Golf uh, recreational facility, that was built on top of if, uh, one, if not two to three mounds. And a lot of these areas that are sacred mounds within Davidson County would register, would be, or should be considered on the national list of historic places. And that's what myself and others are fighting to have recognized. There should be recognition of what existed where the sound stadium is. There should be recognition of all of downtown Nashville is sitting on top of a vast ancient city. All of downtown Nashville sits on top of an ancient sacred site. And that's what we're fighting for, but uh, that's to answer your question in a sense of what we know that is not known, and we're trying to make it known. Um, 
I was, uh, wanted to say one thing we are doing at our church is we've begun land acknowledgments. I was talking to you about that when I left last time. Um, at the beginning of our church service every Sunday. Um, beyond that, uh, what's recommended and some of the things we've gotten nationally from our church organization is to be in relationship with people who are um, in the struggle. So that's why I'm here and you know, want to be in relationship. And beyond that, just, I guess, begin talking about it at our church and seeing what we can do. Um, but we have been doing more in, ra in the uh, racial issues in Nashville. We are trying to teach ourselves to be accountab account in accountable partnerships with oppressed people and uh, work on justice toward justice issues and equity in Nashville and affordable housing, economic equity, education, uh, criminal justice issues that affect black people in particular, people of color uh, the most. And we work with NOAA, and so does this church, I know. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, it kind of brought to mind uh, for me the reality, too, that, like, we this Im impacts all of us. Like, it, our, the climate is changing, people are dying, and, like, our that is that's tied to our well-being, too. Um, and even thinking about land back, like having indigenous peoples and peoples that know this land well take care of the land, giving them the ability to do that benefits every single person in this room. Around the East Bank, I think it's really important for people to, to show up and to, to say that this is important, that we really reimagine the way this is done. The other thing I was wondering about is how can this church do something in worship or maybe through a, a conversation? Um, one of my many favorite scriptures is in Jeremiah, Jeremiah's field, when the, um, I guess it was the Assyrians, the poor Hebrew people were getting conquered right and left every, you know, all the time. And Jeremiah is in prison, actually. The uh, foreign nation is attacking them. And Jeremiah calls his uncle and says, hey, I want you to go buy that land back. Redeem that land that we used to have. And everybody looks at him and says, what the heck are you talking about? You know, we're being attacked. This is, and he says, houses and fields will yet again be sold in this land. You know, which part, Roland? <laughs> <laughs> houses and fields will yet again be sold in this land. The idea that it is in our faith tradition, there are examples. I don't have a specific about how that all happened. That's not at all what I'm saying, but that's, it, mean, it means so much more to me when we think through our faith traditions than just when we say, oh, well, this is a good thing to do. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you for letting me do that sermon. No, uh, thank you for your sermon. Hello, Albert. <laughs> you know what's coming. Uh, Good, good evening, my name is Tom Kunish. I uh, am president of the Tennessee Ancient Sites Conservancy, and uh, my family is Lakota from Standing Rock, Lakota Oyate. And uh, I gotta say I disagree with Albert about whose land this is. If you're looking for the most important site, in my mind, and I've only lived here three some years, I lived 30 years in Chattanooga, uh, and we were dealing with the mound issues down there. And I used to be on the Tennessee Commission of Indian Affairs, and I also agree with the change of, from Indian, which is cultural appropriation. Uh, I think all of you know Browns Creek runs down through here. 6,000 stone box burials of the Yuchi people were taken out from that creek area. This was not Cherokee land. Albert and I have talked in the past, and Albert says that uh, the Cherokee were really good uh, land dealers, and they sold this land, and it's true that it was the Cherokee who sold this land. Uh, it was their hunting land, and they said, yeah, you can have it. You know, there's nobody else around here. This land was essentially vacant, apart from the Shawnee who were here and the Choctaw, but George Washington, 
in 17, I think it was 80, 1776 or no, 86 or something like that, said, why are the Muscogee, why are the Creeks, he said, always fighting this land? This land was Yuchi. Those stone box graves, Aaron Dieter Wolf, Tennessee Division of Archaeology will tell you, stone box graves are associated with the Yuchi people. The Yuchi people, were last, their last town was wiped out, Chestoe, in 1714 by the Cherokee, who had just moved down from North Carolina into the Tennessee River Basin and essentially stayed on the east side of the plateau for their 100 years, 200 years that they were here. From up by Knoxville area down to Chattanooga, Dragon Canoe moved to Chattanooga in 1776. And then down into Alabama. This was not Cherokee land. This, the, when they say the word Mississippian, that word Mississippian says we don't know exactly who because they were gone already. But Okmulgee Mound, in uh, just south of Atlanta in Macon is Muscogee and the Muscogee Nation knows it. All of the mounds here in Tennessee that are Mississippian temple mounds, church essentially, temple mounds were Muscogee and Yuchi related, not Cherokee. These 6,000 burials have not been acknowledged. You have uh, in the seal of, of Nashville, Tennessee, you have an indigenous person, a man, holding a skull like Hamlet, saying, oh, York, I knew you well. And it's uh, kind of a, a, it's a bad cultural appropriation. That should be changed if you're looking for things to do. But that uh, Yuchi Creek, I would re rename Browns Creek to Yuchi Creek, that was 6,000 burials, and everybody acknowledges that, but it's one of the best kept secrets of Nashville. The mounds that Albert's mentioned, Brick Church Mound and all the other mounds, Mississippian mounds, Mound Bottom, huge mound west of the city here, between Mound Bottom west of the city, Castalian Springs east up uh, east of uh, Gallatin, thank you, and then Sellers Mound, all of these, you know, white names uh, are, this was a great art area, art district, most, all of the art, almost all of the art in Tennessee comes from this area, this art district area. So uh, we are working on putting up signs everywhere and we are getting conservation easements so that uh, land is saved from development or that we at least have a voice in it. We take care of some mounds like Chickamauga Mound down in Chattanooga. So I, I hope that you expand and say that this really is Muscogee and Yuchi land, the Yuchi after the destruction of Chistoe, uh, the Yuchi was, went with the Muscogee and then went into the removal in Alabama and where they were defeated again by the Cherokee with Andrew Jackson at the Battle of Tolpeca. Uh, but it's, uh, I think we should work together. I attend friends meeting up here and we did a land acknowledgement and it says Yuchi and Muscogee and acknowledging that uh, the Cherokee sold it, um, but that uh, we should work together as churches, as uh, people of morals, concerns, and work on a land acknowledgement that everybody can share. Frist refuses to say or to change its land acknowledgement, and uh, I hope that we could gather together sometime and talk about uh, what the artifacts are that are here, uh, who they are associated with, and who we should be acknowledging. Thank you. selling the land, but they were
leasing the land out to white settlers for their use of uh, grazing cattle. Other Cherokee leaders said that the Treaty of Sycamore Shoals and the, it was an indemnification of raids that had been conducted by white uh, military forces in the destruction of Cherokee towns. Now also, in reference to who originally lived on this land several thousand years ago, that has never been conclusively determined. I have said in terms of uh, recently that it could have been a multi-ethnic community, as were many native communities multi-ethnic in the 18th and 19th century. And I think that it behooves us to work together rather than to argue about who exclusively lived in this land several thousand years ago. I mean, Tom wants to say it was Uchi, I'll say it was Cherokee, uh, the Shawnee say it was Shawnee, Choctaw say Choctaw, Creek say Creek. Huh, we're all together. We were all native people living here thousands of years ago. It, it seems to me that one thing that all of us can do is do our best to respect what we have received from all the native people who have lived on these lands over all these 15,000 perhaps years. And before that, uh, they've left us a beautiful place and we've done some pretty bad things with it. Just transferring everything into privately owned land rather than land that people were owned by. I do know from what I can learn, my, my ignorant self, people kind of felt more like they were owned by the land than the land owned by them. But in any case, all of us, I think probably, or most of us are stewards in this room, we're stewards of some piece of land currently. No, we won't be forever. Somebody else, uh, some other creature may inherit what we call our own today. But whatever we can do to show our care and respect to the earth, to the other creatures that are here, to the people that are here today, all of them who are here today, the native peoples from whatever tribal groups they may currently be part, as they may have been a part of in the past. We've gotten a beautiful heritage that we are not going to get uh, taken care of. So if we can, if we can respect our understanding of what people have done with us all of us, whether by choice or by death, we can do a great deal. Also, I would say Trying to figure out how to show that kind of responsibility and respect and appreciation as Garrett Bennett said, that I'm going to be on the board. And so we're in the midst of that process right now, just really getting it underway. So I can't say a whole lot about it before any of that will come out. It's something that several of us have been working on and look forward to getting it out into fruition. Thank you. Um, is it okay if I add something to these conversations around land acknowledgements, too? I, I haven't even talked to Albert about this, but I'm going to say it. Um, there are some folks in Oakland, um, Elka mentioned them, that are uh, practicing shumi, which in their native language means gift. And they're encouraging settlers, people that are occupying these lands, visitors to these lands, to pay a land tax to indigenous peoples. Um, as a way of honoring that this is who this land belongs to um, and who is who should are the rightful stewards and also who have these native ways of taking care of the land that all of our lives depend on. Um, so I would encourage you for folks that are thinking about land acknowledgements, what does that mean to also financially steward these spaces and return some of that gift to these peoples? In terms of uh, the future of this land, I think that all good people can share in this land. And that is the Native American position. 
all bad people need to go. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> um, we are we are 20 minutes over. Kate, thank you for allowing us to go over. I feel like this, these conversations needed to happen tonight so, to keep the ball rolling. Um, If you could asterisk your name on there so that I can, when I look through it, I'm like, that's who I need to send it to. Um, that'd be great. Um, again, Kate, thank you. Thank you to Belmont UMC for having us. And this is not the end. This is just now we've set some little flames, right? And let's put these flames together so that it can grow bigger and we can actually, like, make something happen here in Nashville or out in California or wherever you're from, um, Franklin. Um, but let's keep moving together in interdependence and in community with one another.